Today I'm going to show you how I made this brick pattern cutting board. I'll start by marking and cutting several pieces of this walnut board. Normally I would use my miter saw station for something like this, but I have the fence torn apart right now for another project I'm designing. Now I go ahead and rip out strips for the first glue up. The width of this piece is just slightly wider than the finished brick is going to be, which in this case was about two inches. After stealing one of my daughter's lollipops, I planed the pieces down until they were just clean, keeping the maximum thickness that I could out of the original six quarter that I started with. Next I cut the strips that will be the mortar between the bricks. The piece was just a little too long to cut with the garage door down, so I had to go ahead and open it for this cut. Now outside you can see all of the rainwater from Tropical Storm Imelda, which had just blown through. Even with the splitter, the wood wanted to pinch the blade, so I stuck a shim in the kerf to keep it open. Making these cuts made me finally break down and buy a dedicated rip blade. Here's a little trick I like to use to make large height adjustments on my planer quickly. Now how thick you make your mortar strips is entirely up to what you think looks good, but I like to make them a quarter of an inch, which incidentally is as thin as I can go on this planer. I measure the strips to find the center, promptly mismark the center by an inch, and then stack them up so that I can cut them to the wrong length all at one time. Thankfully the shorter half of the strips was still plenty long enough for what I needed. The last piece in this glue up needs to be half the width of the other pieces so that when you alternate them you get that brick wall effect. Since I made the main pieces 2 inch, I'm cutting this one down to 1 inch. Since I cut the brick from 6 quarter stock and the mortar from 8 quarter stock, I went ahead and trimmed the maple pieces down so that I would have a flat even glue up. After applying the liquid polyvinyl acetate bonding agent in the most inefficient manner I could think of, I alternated the walnut and maple strips finishing with the one inch thick piece. You can see I forgot to trim down that last maple strip and it sticks above the rest of the board. I just knocked it down with a hand plane once it was dry. After the board's out of clamps, I square up one end on the crosscut sled and then crosscut the entire board in half to make the blanks I need to make two different cutting boards. Since the board is too wide to run through the planer with the grain and I don't have a drum sander, I use the router sled to get this side nice and flat. Clamping my dust collector hose near the side of the sled was only mildly successful at keeping down the horrendous mess that this thing makes. Okay, I used the router sled to uh, plane this all down flat, and I wanted to show you a mistake that I made that I had made before and didn't learn my lesson the first time that is pretty easy to do. When it was in the glue up, uh, 
one of my maple pieces shifted upwards while I was clamping it and it got out of position like this. And that meant that when I was planing this all down flat, I had to take out quite a bit more wood than I intended to get it all even again. So these pieces are, as you can see, a fair bit thinner than I was originally going to make them, though I did cut these oversized because I knew I was going to have to plan them down. Um, that's not really a problem. It'll just be whatever it wants to be. Whatever size it ends up being is the size it's going to be, and we're not going to worry about it. But uh, in the future, for my reference and yours, use calls across the top to keep everything flat, and that won't be a problem. So the next thing to do is going to be to turn it this way and rip our strips along the fence and cut it up into sections like this and turn them up on its end grain and then we will make the mortar going the other direction. The width that you cut these strips is going to determine the finished thickness of your cutting board. In this case I did an inch and three quarters so that after planing I would have a finished board thickness of about an inch and five eighths. So another common mistake that people make is on this second mortar piece. You need a long skinny piece here so people will take a long skinny rip out of their mortar material and stick it in like that and say, well, how else would you do it? The problem with this is you have the grain in this running up and down and the grain in this piece is running left and right and you don't want to cross up your grain patterns. Depending on who you listen to, at worst, it'll make the entire board crack and fall apart, which, you know, I've seen pictures of. At best, if it doesn't crack and uh, come apart, it will have differential expansion and contraction enough that you feel the bumps. So you're going to have uh, raised mortar pieces because this stuff is going to want to expand this way. And this stuff is going to be fairly stable along its ingrain dimension. So what you do to combat that, you take several pieces of wood, and this is a scrap I had from a, another cutting board I did, and you glue them together kind of like you're making a you know, a tabletop glue up, and then you rip thin pieces out of it this way, and then turn it up on edge. And obviously you'd need to rip that again to make it thinner, but that will give you ingrain mortar strips so that everything goes the same direction. I cut off a piece of maple, planed one side flat, cross cut it in half, squared up the edges, and then glued it together to make a wide piece. Once that was out of the clamps, I squared up the end grain on one side using the crosscut sled so I'd have a smooth face to run against the fence. I used one of the strips I had already cut to set the fence distance so that my maple strips I'm about to cut will be the same height. And right there is where I realized I'd forgot to put the splitter back in, so I turned the saw off and put it back on safety first, or at least in the top five. Because of the shape of the board, this looks like a rip cut, but the end grain is up against the fence, so I'm using my crosscut blade. Once I had that board cut into strips, I turned it 90 degrees so that the end grain is facing up and down and ripped it into quarter inch strips to match the other quarter inch mortar pieces I had already cut. These thin strips had enough flex in them going through the saw blade that it didn't really leave a glue ready surface, so I wrapped some sandpaper around a block and gave them a quick touch up to remove the rough spots. This is another application that a drum sander would be perfect for. 
Once I was done sanding those pieces, we do another glue up, which is very much like the first glue up, except that instead of running long ways, the ingrain is running up and down. Pretzel if I want one. Mm -hmm. That's very thoughtful. I got some in my bowl. That's very thoughtful. Here. Dude. I got glue all over my hands right now, baby. Oh. But I can give it to you. You can give it to me. Thank you, you very much. Um, That's the best pretzel ever. You give me two. I've got a plant on my coat. But that's okay. You see a spider I killed. Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of those. I just see one. Really? Mm -hmm. Right there. Right there? Yeah. There's a lot of spiders. Yeah. In our house. And then the quads. Yeah. Everywhere. It's everywhere. Take care of them later. Ah, no one. Never mind. Oh, another one. Another one. Oh, another one. Wow. And another one. It's a regular. And another one. And another one. And another one. <laughs> I think you're making stuff up now. I like to do the handle with a half inch core box bit. The formula for how far apart your stops need to be is the width of the board plus the width of the handle centered on the bit. Don't forget to adjust your fence so that it's centered on the thickness as well. The surface right off of the router sled is very flat but because of the way the bit works you end up with these ridges right here and while that is completely flat to the touch right here it leaves a line there and the reason that is is because when this router bit is spinning through here like this it's compressing these fibers in this direction and they all kind of lay over that way and then when I make the pass on this side it's compressing fibers in this direction I might be able to minimize that by taking smaller passes, but I am incredibly impatient. So the only good way to get rid of these is to sand. And since I am incredibly impatient, I am going to go with uh, 60 grit on this 90 millimeter Rotex sander. Uh, the reason that I am going to use a 90 millimeter Rotex instead of the 150 millimeter Rotex is because I don't own a 150 millimeter Rotex. You can do this with just any random orbit sander. I've done it plenty of times with my 5-inch rigid, but it just takes forever. I have this, so I'm going to use it. 
There were a few very small knots on one side of the board, so I just filled them with some 5 minute epoxy and they were almost invisible when the board was finished. My preference for edge treatment on boards is a 1 8 inch roundover bit, but I almost went rebellious on this one and did a 45 degree chamfer. Almost. I wipe the board with a damp rag to raise the grain so I can sand it back down again with 220 so that when I oil the board later the grain does not raise and give me a rough finished surface. You didn't think I was going to let you get a sneak peek, did you? I was planning on doing a nice quiet oiling, but my daughter decided that was the perfect time to bust through the door and yell about how much she loved Elsa, so enjoy this nice guitar music instead. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, leave it a thumbs up. If you didn't, leave it a thumbs down. Consider subscribing and I'll see you next time. Take care.